thanks, very much, Kieran. Um, thanks to all of our speakers. Um, I would ask for Neil and Kieran and with a cameo from our own Ted Pollard. Um, certainly covered a lot of a lot of the world in, in those presentations and a lot of a lot of themes that are connecting again to the the presentations in the first session. Um, I suppose just by way of maybe a, a sort of short summary of what was there. Um, Agadez has described a fascinating combination of the professional approaches to um, landscape investigation and seascape investigation, but very much with that community focus and community participation that's, that's coming through. And something that really stood out for me from that was around how values are constructed around the heritage and why it's important and how to address these changes that are, that are coming through. And in that engagement, then to build up a picture of where the losses are happening and how they're happening and, and what that means to people today locally and what that means for decision makers and what that means for the academic community and understanding the places. We then see in Denmark where we have a, a highly regulated system with a lot of data about places. A lot of these sites already haven't been identified and some good quantified data about those sites that are under risk and those that are under active destruction now as a result of climatic change. But the challenges then that they bring, um, and that whole question again about loss, about recording, about participation, and striking again values where the local communities or what, how they feel about those sites and how that sits alongside national legislation and established practice. And then Karen has, has outlined how some of those issues are being addressed again within the context of the Cherish project. So while there is a baseline, there's a baseline which is incomplete and it's being added to. And it's not just about the individual monuments and places, it's about the context in which they lie and what those mean for the long-term management strategies. So it's not just the fact of the monument or the artifact spread or the collection of material that's there, it's how the dynamics of sea and coastal change are impacting upon that survival. And uh, that chimed in a way back to the, the discussion earlier on about the concept of a seascape or a landscape under the sea as a thing today, as opposed to something which happened um, from long ago. So we do have some questions that have come through. Um, and I'm just doing a, a bit of a, a scroll backward and forward between two screens here. Um, but maybe just to, to, to kick off on the question, I suppose it's a slightly obvious one maybe for Elgada at the beginning. The concept of communicating heritage through song and the whole or through music, uh, musicality, and the the use of that for sharing a message. Um, the idea of songs of the sea are very, very common um, within Ireland, usually in terms of longing and loss, or of, of romance that has disappeared over the horizon, or some dramatic event that has happened. But clearly, where you're talking about musicality and communicating heritage is in a different um, area. So I was wondering how how has that idea spread within the the, the participation? Because really you're talking with people who live there and people who are wanting to share and learn about and explore. So like was that a an idea which has been around for a long time, or is it a new thing that, that you've developed? Um, thanks, John. It's it's not really a, a new no idea, I would say. It, it, it has been in existence, people communicating the different ideas by using music, communicating the message among the people. But it is more or less a new thing, um, translating academic works into music and making these academic publications more um, reachable to their people. So many of uh, our academic publications are, are not public, publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are not open access. So some of the members of the local people at the sites where we are working, they are not getting access to these publications. And even if they get access, the reading rate is very limited. Okay. But having those academic publications into songs in a simple, more clear languages, which also be accessible to the majorities has been very fantastic. And uh, the re local radios and televisions are broadcasting this music uh, to the to the televisions, which is really fantastic, and the public buses. Much more important is uh, having community radios, which are promoting the same idea, but also giving the opportunity for the people to see the, some of the pictures of the coastal eroding, some of the archaeological artifacts on the site. That has been very very useful. Mm -hmm. 
And then maybe connecting that then to what, what Kieran had talked about with the, the mapping and the acquisition of data, have you found that that citizen sense or citizen participation is allowing you to build up uh, a solid evidence base about these places that you can go back to review and to, to assess again? Has that been working out well? It, it is. It, it's something that we are, are, are definitely moving forward and, and any location that, that we go to, we get great engagement from the, the local people, the, the people who are, are walking the coastline every single day, the people who have grown up uh, in those areas, are, have recognised that not only is change occurring, but, but that rate of change has passed. And when we frequently hear that the changes that have happened in the last 20 to 30 years uh, have been different to what went on, on beforehand. So there is great engagement of, of the local people. Mm -hmm. and. It will be later on this month. The um, in Ireland, we are initiating our first citizen science coastal monitoring um, process in collaboration with the the Copper Coast down in uh, in Waterford. And there, we've uh, selected a number of sites where the the locals uh, who are observing the change happening already will be able to record that, um, and then we'll build up a a picture of the hopefully the rate of change and the type of change that that's occurring in, in those sites. Okay, and, and then I get asked to see you've answered there about the engagement with the underwater dimension, so not just those places where one can walk about and see and share the traditions. Have you been able to bring the local community under the water and, and into the into the submerged aspect of the of the heritage? Um, it would be in diving or knowledge or fishing or whatever the activities are that are ongoing. Yes, we we we, we have conducted multiple workshops with uh, local people where uh, professional divers have trained the local people on how to do diving and record sites underwater. And this has been very useful because after the workshop, we are getting feedback from those uh, local divers who have been diving just to catch fish and do the things. They are telling us where the sites are and therefore giving us some locations and the type of the materials they are finding underwater. Uh, and unfortunately, some are collecting some of the complete ceramics from underwater, which they collect as part of yeah. the, the evidence to show us that we have seen these kind of, of, of objects. But good enough, we're having um, an idea of where they are collecting these materials from and what kind of other materials might be found there. So they are getting a lot of interest, which is quite interesting uh, to learn that they are knowing it and they are engaging themselves into exposing some of the underwater materials. Mm -hmm. I think that that sort of chimed a little bit with what Ted talked about in the in the, the debris spreads of the uh, ballast and the, the artifacts that have come forward. And you talked about the development of community museums or community presentations of that material. So, um, and is the information then being shared, you know, locally and talked about and, and enjoyed? You know, in the, the, the idea of local museums or local presentation presentation or exhibition. Is, is that me or Ted? Yeah, well, yes. Either or, either or. Yes, we, we, we have co-created a museum, and particularly during this uh, pande pandemic period, where people are not able to travel and they're not able to gather, but they could still uh, meet one, two people and survey the coast. So what we did was to engage some uh, local knowledgeable people to try find out the type of the materials that they would want to showcase to the visitor so that whenever the situation normalizes, people can come to the site and see some new innovative and, and new exhibitions at the site. So they are very, very instrumental and uh, they donated some of the materials which they have been keeping in house for years. Mm -hmm. Like at the site of Kirwak Suwani, there were um, never Chitik, a British archaeologists who excavated marvelous sites in the 50s and 60s. And some people who, are worked, with, who worked with him, they had the knowledge and they had gone further distances to see some of the objects. So they were bringing these complete ceramics to say, we needed these to be mounted in the museum and be part and parcel of what we want the general public to, to see. And their narratives as well has been uh, very important part and parcel of the exhibition. So it's, it's, it's uh, an invention that you could say it wasn't existing at the at the site, and the people are very happy that there is something people can visit and learn from one center what the site is all about, including the coastal heritage. Uh -huh. 
that, that has been a fantastic development, even in spite of the COVID-19 situation, that there is still that communication and the sharing of the information. And they know in, in the context of the Cherish project, um, some of the planned public engagement, public interactions haven't been possible, but all being well, I think this year, Kieran, you're hoping to, to, to share some more of that um, with the local communities. Very definitely. We, we've had to curtail our, our face-to-face meetings, but you know, there are benefits from the, this video um, kind of like you know, um, conferencing and, and, and being able to, to virtually meet, meet one. So it, like in, in terms of the, the outreach side, it, it still continued. Um, we're, we're down at the Altona Festival uh, in Waterford again in, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, mm-hmm. virtually again there we hope to run our, our training events online and you know hopefully we're at the, the beginning of the end and, and we'll be moving towards face-to-face sessions and we'll be able to continue on as we have planned originally no oh, super well listen we're, we're up against the time now we've, we've, we've our time used up um and i uh, just want to say thank you again to el and ted and to pernil and to um kieran for three really really interesting presentations and uh, I'll be looking forward to, to, to finding out more about all of those and indeed to go and have a look online at YouTube for some of the, the communication and song and music of the, of, of the heritage. We have our lunch break now for the next hour. Um, I hope everybody takes the opportunity to go and stretch your legs and wave your hands and, and move about from in front of the computer. Um, you get a bit of lunch and then we'll join back up again in an hour's time um, for the, the next of the sessions which will be chaired at that stage by Big Kieran. So, Thank you all again. Thanks everybody for logging on and joining us this morning and look forward to your participation in the afternoon.